So, hi everyone, I'm Yvonne Salander with the Somerset County Library System, and today I'm going to share some books that I've read this year that I've really enjoyed. And yes, I've read all the books. I've had a lot of time on my hands, not traveling and such, so I will be sharing my favorites from this year with you. So in today's installment of The Book Lover's Tea, the 2021 virtual edition, I'm going to start with the past, come into the present, hit up some romances, and then finish up with some feel-good favorites, because that sounds like something we all need right now. So let's start. So I'm going to start with Better Luck Next Time by Julia Claiborne Johnson. It's 1938 in Reno, Nevada, where divorce ranches are popular with wives who want to end their failed marriages because after a six-week stay, a divorce is done, and these ladies can return home newly single. These wealthy women need to be entertained during their stay, so cowboys are hired, and the hired hands are warned to not get involved with the guests, and Ward never had a problem with that rule. Until he did. The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. Nella has a successful apothecary shop in London in the 18th century. After a horrific betrayal, she constructs a false wall in her shop and changes her focus from healing to hurting, helping women eliminate the men that are causing them harm. In the present, Caroline takes her 10-year anniversary trip to London solo after a betrayal by her husband. Joining a group looking for treasures on the tideline of the Thames, she finds a vial with an odd raised symbol in the glass. Could she have found a vial from the lost apothecary? So many books do this dual timeline thing with past and present meeting, but none really do it as well as this one. So this book makes you really ponder the limited options available to women in the past if they wanted to leave a bad marriage. Kind of like this next book. Hour of the Witch by Chris Bojalian. Mary Deerfield has had enough of her abusive husband. This young woman has endured endless verbal and physical abuse in her marriage, but when her husband stabs her in the back of the hand with a fork, she has decided enough is enough. She's feared for her life, so she files for a divorce. Now, Mary must prove in a court of law that her husband was abusive. But her husband is an upstanding citizen in the community. He just says his wife is clumsy, and she somehow managed to impale herself on the spout of a tea kettle. In the courtroom, it is bewildering to see how much has changed, yet stayed the same, since 1662. The Children's Blizzard by Melanie Benjamin. When children went to school the morning of January 12, 1888, it was unusually mild. Woolen underclothes and heavy winter coats were left on the clotheslines to dry. But that day, as school is letting out, the weather drastically changes and the worst blizzard anyone ever remembers to hit the prairie happens. So two young school teachers, sisters Raina and Gerda Olson, until recently school children themselves are suddenly faced with life and death decisions at their schoolhouses. One sister is hailed as the hero of the prairie, the other is vilified by the community for her actions. The Raft of Stars by Andrew J. Graff. Ten-year-old Fisher spends his summers with his grandfather and hangs out with Dale Bread Breadwin from down the road. Fish and Bread learn all sorts of skills from Fish's grandfather on the farm, and they talk about all the ways that Bread's dad may have disaster befall him. The night Fish follows a nervous Bread home and sees with his own eyes how horrible Bread's dad is, Fish does what he has to do to protect his friend. He picks up the revolver sitting on the counter just inside the door. Now the two friends are fleeing the manhunt they know is coming for them and going to send them to jail. They enter the vast Wisconsin wilderness with one goal, get to the armory and find Fish's dad. But there are big secrets the boys have from one another and that the river and woods hold too. Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Every year, the Riva siblings throw a party in Malibu to celebrate the end of summer. And over time, it has morphed into the party of the summer. There's no invitations. You just have to know when and where the party's going to be held. And this year, two unexpected guests are making their way to the party. 1983 is shaping up to be the wildest, most epic party yet. Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. Murrow and Elena fall in love in a city torn apart by unrest. Murrow decided that they and their young daughter should go to the U.S. so they can get jobs and send money back to Elena's mom in Bogota, Colombia. Time passes 
Elena has a son, and they live in fear since they're now in the U.S. legally. When Elena is pregnant with her third child, Moro is deported. Unable to provide for her older children and care for an infant, Elena sends the newborn to Bogota to live with her father and grandmother. Split between two countries, this is the story of a family struggling to do what's best for each family member. We begin at the end by Chris Whitaker. Duchess Day Radley is a foul-mouthed, resourceful, tough-as-nail, self-proclaimed outlaw at 13 years old. She does everything she can to hold her small family together, taking care of her little brother and doing her best to give him a secure and safe life since their mother, Star, is barely functional at the best of times. It all started 30 years ago when Duchess's young aunt was killed in a hit and run and Star's high school sweetheart, Vincent, was sent to prison for the crime. Now Vincent's out and back in town and with his return, the fragile balance tips and the entire town is embroiled in the turmoil. Sometimes good people do bad things for good reasons. Does that make them a bad person? Hi everyone, this is Sean. Sean is a big fan of the library. He's very happy to be talking about books today, especially audiobooks. He's not much of a reader, he's more of a listener. And he loves listening to comedies and thrillers, right? Yes, and anything with sound effects and obviously anything that has a cat in it everything that we can find at the library. He also likes listening to music, and he's pretty keen on movies. Big action fan, right? Fast and Furious, we love cars. You wouldn't think a cat would love cars. This cat loves cars. Yeah, he's gonna help us talk about books today. He doesn't know about this plan, but uh, he's got this, right buddy? You got this. Last Summer at the Golden Hotel by Alyssa Friedland. The Golden Hotel is the last resort standing in the once world-renowned Borscht Belt in the Catskills. When it opened 60 years ago, the wait list for Prime Weeks was a year long, at least. Now, if half the rooms are full for the 4th of July week, it is a minor miracle. A casino is knocking at the door, and now all of the owners, the members of the Goldmans and the Weingolds, need to meet to decide the fate of the Golden. Will this summer be the last summer? The Liar's Dictionary by Ellie Williams. To prevent plagiarism by nefarious competitors, dictionaries will insert mount weasels, fake entries, into their text. But what if one of the employees at a Victorian era dictionary goes a bit rogue and starts inserting words he's created and no one notices for decades? Who decides what a real word is anyway? All words were made up at one point or another, so what's wrong with making up some more? Everyone in this room will someday be dead by Emily R. Austin. Ilva lost her job at the bookstore because she didn't show up for days. Getting out of bed was an impossibility. She just couldn't do it. Having an inkling she's in need of some help, she heads to a group session advertised on a flyer and stops at the doorway. But when she stops at the doorway, she wonders why is a counseling session being held in a church? Misunderstanding her reason for being there, the kindly priest assumes she's there for the new receptionist job. And that's how 20-something, extremely anxious, depressed, atheist, lesbian Gilda becomes the new receptionist at St. Rigobert's Catholic Church. The heart of the book is Gilda's mental health struggles. She's a likable person. Her inner monologues are quirky and identifiable. You cheer for her whenever she makes a dent in the piles of dirty dishes. It's an insightful look at one woman's struggle with anxiety and depression. Black Buck by Matteo Ascaripur. Darren is working at Starbucks one fateful day when he decides to upsell the right, possibly wrong, guy. He's offered a job in sales at a highly successful tech startup. He's the only black man in the whole cult-like company. And as his sales skills improve, he gets swept up into a plan to help other people of color break into the sales force in companies across the world. Written like a self-help business book complete with text blocks to point out helpful sales tips, this book gets more absurd and addictive with every turn of the page. Good Neighbors by Sarah Langan. A couple of decades into the future, the record-breaking summer heat is blamed for the large sinkhole opening up near Maple Street. When a girl falls in, the community looks for someone to blame. The end result? 
murder. While this isn't a retelling of The Crucible, the mass hysteria created from the mouths of children are definitely going to bring that classic play to mind. The truly masterful twist in the storytelling are the chapter headers, with excerpts of scholarly articles, pop psychology, and true crime reporting, because as readers, we know a girl fell into a sinkhole, but we don't know who until halfway through the book. And we know there's a murder, but that gruesome crime isn't revealed until the final pages. To Love and to Loathe by Martha Waters. Widowed Diana Templeton is an unapologetic flirt, content in the power and freedom her recently acquired widowhood gives her. Jeremy, Marquess of Willingham, is a rake, a man who's taken dozens of lovers and is doing his best to avoid matrimony and the responsibilities that come with it. The two have been friends since childhood, their bickering now evolving into biting flirtations they equally enjoy. Jeremy recently received a bad review between the sheets, while Diana's late husband was less than enthusiastic in his attempt to produce an heir. Each feels the other will be a safe liaison, an honest critic, and they are both hoping this interlude at Jeremy's country house will put these infatuations to rest. <laughs> yeah, right. People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. Poppy and Alex met during a rideshare in college. They are complete opposites. She couldn't wait to leave Ohio, he couldn't wait to get back. He loves his khaki, she loves bold, bright colors. He's a bit of a homebody, and she wants to travel the world. But there's a tradition of that one week a year, the summer trip. For over a decade, Poppy and Alex got together one week every summer to explore a place they haven't been. But three years ago, the trip ended in disaster. They haven't spoken in years, and Poppy is desperate to reconnect. While circumstances are conspiring against her, she needs to scrape together the ultimate summer trip to win back her best friend. But can they really be just friends? Hannah Khan Carries On by Uzma Jalaluddin. Three Sisters Barani Poutine is the only halal restaurant in the Golden Crescent neighborhood of Toronto, yet sales are slow. Hannah helps out her mom and sister running the restaurant when she can, but radio is her passion. All is chugging along in her life until the signs go up. Another halal restaurant is opening across the street, and their goal is to put her family's restaurant out of business. Choices. That's the core of this book. Yeah, it's a retelling of You've Got Mail, but it's more than a simple romance. A hate crime rocks her world. She's never encountered such hate against Muslims before in her neighborhood. And when she's asked to start a new segment for the radio station she works for, she feels it's going to create more of a divide. So she has to decide, will she compromise her ethics to get ahead? The Matzo Ball by Jean Meltzer. Rachel Rubenstein Goldblatt has secrets. Rachel, daughter of a prominent rabbi, is also Margot Cross, the highly successful author of Christmas romances. Her publisher wants something new, and she knows that Rachel slash Margot is the one to write it, a Hanukkah-themed romance. Rachel needs inspiration. She needs a ticket to the sold-out Matzo Ball Max. Her father's lighting the 10-foot menorah at the ball, so of course she can get a ticket, right? But it's not that easy, because Jacob Greenberg, the event organizer, is her arch nemesis and first crush from Jewish summer camp all those decades before. Will Rachel get her story? Will she find romance during the eight nights of Hanukkah? Will her secrets, including her chronic illness, be revealed? Talk Bookish to Me by Kate Bromley. Kara Sullivan is on deadline. Her eighth romance novel is due right after her best friend's wedding. And she hasn't started writing it yet. She just isn't feeling inspired. But at the pre-wedding party, she meets the groom's childhood friends, including Ryan Thompson. Ryan, her first love, her college sweetheart, the man she still has feelings for, both warm and fuzzy and cold and prickly. Being forced to be in his presence could work for her, though. She could finally have the inspiration she needs to write this book. But can she use the sparks flying between them to write her novel without getting her heart broken a second time? Before I Saw You by Emily Hofton. Alfie Mack is enjoying himself on the rehab ward. He's made new friends and he enjoys being the life of a party. Well, as much of a party as one can have in hospital recovering from having your leg amputated. One day, a mysterious patient appears in the bed next to him, silent and curtained away from the ward. The woman is a complete mystery. And Alfie loves a mystery almost as much as he loves people. 
After a few days of silence, Alice Gunnersley finally starts to speak. She's burned over half of her body, and she won't allow anyone in the ward to see her until after her next operation. But by then it's too late. Alfie has fallen in love with a woman he's never seen. And strangely, Alice thinks she might love him too. Dial A for Aunties by Jesse Q. Satanto. Medi's blind date was a bit of a disaster. And all right, so that's a major understatement, but it was an accident. Uh, but Medi freaked out and put his dead body in the trunk of her car. So she confides in her mom, cause you know, who else can you trust? But unfortunately her mother decides to call all of her sisters. So now you've got four Indo-Chinese aunties who all think they know best helping out with the unfortunate situation. They all decide to put the body in a large cooler since the family wedding business is working a lavish 2,000 person wedding the next day and the body's gonna have to be stored a bit before they can take care of it. Of course, Big Aunt's assistant comes early the next morning and helpfully loads all the coolers and ships them over to the exclusive island resort ahead of schedule, including the cooler with the body inside. The Invisible Husband of Frick Island by Colleen Oakley. Anders is sent by a small newspaper to cover the Frick Island cakewalk. Anders hates boats, bugs, casual clothing, but you know, tiny Frick Island has something that appeals to him more than he hates everything else. It's got a good story. Piper's husband Tom went missing at sea and she held out hope he was ever coming back to her. But one morning he did. She's the only one who sees him. The entire island goes along with it and they say hello to Tom when she goes to meet him at the docks. Andrew's intrigued, so under the guise of creating a podcast about climate change, he interviews the locals and finds reasons to talk with Piper. As his subscribers climb and he learns more about Frick Island, the locals, and Piper, he begins to feel torn about success and the relationships he's forming. Will the Islanders, and most importantly Piper, think when the cell phone tower goes up and they finally get to listen to his podcast, what the frick? The Music of Bees by Eileen Garvin. Alice Holtzman lost her parents, her husband, and her dream. She'll need a little outside help, help she doesn't really want or expect, to discover a new life and new dreams can start at 44. This is the story of how an introverted beekeeper ends up with two young men living in her spare room in Bunkhouse and how the music of bees brings them together. Three lost souls find their purpose, their voice, and their place in this engaging debut novel. The Reading List by Sarah Nisha Adams. Mukesh, a widower, desperately misses his wife. When he finds a grimy, dusty library book on a back shelf, he decides he's gonna read it all the while feeling a deep connection to his late wife. She was a really big reader. The Time Traveler's Wife is wonderful. He loves it and he's thinking about reading stories. It might be something that he missed all these years. Alicia's working at the library as a summer job before school year begins. She isn't a reader, but her brother is and he suggested she apply. When an elderly man comes in looking for reading suggestions, she remembers that reading list she found in a return book. The first title on the list is To Kill a Mockingbird. So she checks it out to read and sees if she can recommend it the next time the patron's in. She does, and they're both hooked on the mysterious reading list. You'll end this book with a smile and a contented feeling. This is not to say this tale doesn't tackle difficult topics like grief and mental health struggles, but watching the friendship bloom between Mukesh and Alicia is heartwarming. As a librarian, watching two people discover a love of reading truly sparks the warm fuzzies in me. Walking in the shoes of Mukesh and Alicia and watching their new community connections help them through the roughest patches in their lives makes you feel like you know them and you're wishing them well with every turn of the page.